or we'll give everyone a couple more seconds to see if anyone else is joining, and then we'll probably kick it off. Okay. <laughs> You can also tweet, you know, grab an extra five people from the hallway, fill it in, no problem. <laughs> Take a picture, share that on Twitter with your other coworkers or anything like that. Or um, if you're in China, Baidu, Weixin, something, like, share it out. <laughs> yeah, and I think with that, we'd like to probably start and share a little bit of our experience for uh, building websites in the Asian market. Um, we'd like to kick off by introducing ourselves Hi everyone, my name is Adriana. Uh, I'm a senior project manager at FFW. I've been working with uh, Drupal for about seven years or seven plus years now, and I've been doing project management for about eight years or so. And I'm Andrew Wilden, director of strategy and solution architecture at FFW. I have been doing Drupal since it was not fun to say you were doing Drupal. If anyone remembers the era of Drupal 4 and no install screen, you feel my pain. But uh, you know, over the last couple of years, as we've grown, we've actually noticed quite a bit of change in how sites you know, evolve, you know, what are the requirements for building something. But most interesting is, let's just say, look at a regular map of the world, right? This is our usual, here's our offices, everywhere we're located. If you resize and think about the world in terms of internet usage, in 2011, the world looked quite different, right? Basically, just resizing the entire map based on the number of internet users. Uh, pretty much, you see a fairly heavy focus on you know, East Asia in particular, which makes sense given it is home to some four billion plus people. But interestingly, if you actually look at just growth in the last 10 years, Internet adoption throughout the region has doubled. So this map is already massively out of date and should be much bigger bubbles on like the right side of it. As we've gone through and seen kind of these general trends, one interesting complexity that's come up in a lot of the larger platform builds we do is it's not simply enough to translate content anymore. Right, back in Drupal 7, it was a great thing that you could install a couple modules, your content was quasi-multilingual, uh, we don't need to get into how hacky multilingual was in V7, but it was a thing. Drupal 8, we ended up adopting multilingual in core. That, in some ways, was just you know market demand, right? There was quite a lot of work being invested from the community just to get multilingual up and running. But more generally speaking, it actually preceded a lot of trends that came a few years later that web experiences worldwide needed to be much more fine-tuned and local to the audiences they served. As we've gone through and done, you know, over the last few years, going from two to three sites that had to focus on East Asia in particular, now we're up to, you know, 20, 30. In almost any major platform build, this is a consideration that comes up and the question always occurs. What exactly do you do differently? Is there anything fundamentally unique about doing you know, a site that's going to be based out of East Asia? Does it being in China make it different than doing a site for Japan or Korea? And while this could be a five minute talk of make sure to check and make that it's localized or a four hour talk of every nuance, we've just got you know, three key points we wanna go over in the next 20 minutes of just really easy takeaways for it next time you have a project focusing on East Asia, what you can focus on to start from. So number one, just take into account the context in which you're building. If I'm being really general, this is technically the Asian market, which is why our title of the presentation is a little misleading. When you're dealing with over half the planet, there's not any one single market you can actually design for. If we even get into some more detail, right? We're talking 48 countries, over 2,300 languages, and every region is actually quite unique. Even just a typical site you're doing for one country, you can be encountering you know, five, 10, 20 different personas, so trying to group all of this at the top level is next to impossible. But still taking into account you know, some general trends of how much scale we're looking at, you know, there can be quite a lot of gap from region to region, so start there. So for the exercises of what, you know, we're gonna be talking through in more detail, 
we're just going to focus it down to China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, right? So going down from four some billion to 1.6. Yeah, and when we're talking about all of these countries, uh, that's great, and there are a lot of things to cover. But at the end of the day, uh, we are building products for humans, and at the core, how we do things and how we act um, relies a lot on the culture that we have. So we want to take a step back and discuss a little bit about that, which is not necessarily related to technology first, but it is going to decide how you build technology for humans and how your products are actually going to be built. So there's a Dutch researcher that spent a lot of time doing uh, data analysis on how different cultures and countries perceive uh, six key differentiations between countries and um, cultures at their core. So we wanted to highlight those because they would be important in driving some of the decisions that you make for how you position your product, how you build your product, and how you build the user experience around it. So power distance um, is something very important because um, it helps understand how society perceives different hierarchy levels and how everything is constructed at the society level and what drives some of their decisions. Individualism is another key point. Uh, how feminine or masculine the society is and how they build a culture of collaboration. How uh, uh, happy they are with ambiguity and uncertainty or are they scared about it? That may uh, impact a lot how you do commerce or how they take some other decisions in regards to money and um, other things going on with that and how they plan for the future, for the long-term vision that they have and how indulgent they are with different errors or mistakes or returns that may, they may need to make and other shipments that go with that. So we want to emphasize one thing that this describes more the cultural um, aspect of this and that it applies to broader audiences. It doesn't apply to individual people. So it's important to keep that in mind. And we did a very quick test. Um, there's a website where you can compa compare different countries in regards to these six key um, elements at the cultural level. And uh, we took here a comparison of China, France, and the United States. So you can see how all of these countries um, compare to one another. And if you are a global brand, you may want to position yourselves and to have a present in all of these very different markets. So it's important to understand that how you do that is going to be driven by some of these cultural differences that you have, which are at the core level of a nation. So that drives us um, into a conversation point about experience. And you may ask yourselves how exactly some of those key elements could impact what you design on a website or, what, or how you do the design in a product. And we wanted to highlight a couple of um, aspects and elements that we thought about. So one of them is logos. Some countries may want to have an emphasis on how big the logo is and how preeminent something is when you go on a website. Uh, another important point could be the usage of colors. There may be uh, countries or cultures where you need to have a very high contrast between the colors. Or there may be situations when you need to have a very subtle, complementary look to them. The content strategy is also going to be very important because how you deliver the messages and the perception that your visitors have about it is going to drive the elements on the page and how everything is built around that. Uh, some people or the, the message delivered in some of the areas needs to be short, whereas in other areas it needs to be very long and explicative so that it builds more trust and more connection with the brand. Another thing is call to actions, which are very important in how you drive your business and how you uh, figure out that you have a conversion or other you know, actions to take regarding that. Should they be subtle on the pages? Should they be very preeminent on the pages? Those are important details that are going to be very different from one country to another, even though we look at the Asian market as a whole. Right, and what's interesting is this is nothing new for most of us, right? Just quite a quick survey from the audience. How many people here are you know, either in a development agency or freelance doing you know, Drupal? Raise your hands. 
How many people are in you know, larger scale multinational business? Okay, so overlap, nice little Venn diagram there. Uh, the idea that your audiences actually understand the visual cues differently, that can change from persona to persona on any given website. It becomes a lot trickier when we're dealing with, let's say, four or five different regions that each have their own set of stakeholders. On some recent projects we've encountered, this has actually become a bit of a sticking point, right? Who makes the ultimate decision? Are we looking at you know, in-market decision of you know, how the customers are interacting with the product? Are we looking at executive stakeholders who may be in one region or another but are trying to enforce you know, some sense of brand compliance? One way to walk back from that is actually to simply give a framework like this out. It's like, okay, let's actually prioritize piece by piece how we want to make a decision, right? What are areas where local market context may matter more than you know, executive sign-off or more than you know, even some certain elements of brand compliance where the brand was not originally suited to extend to that direction. One interesting example where this actually can work in reverse is uh, previous to coming back to the US and coming to FFW, I was working in open source adoption for the Chinese government. So this is a former life of mine, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Kunming, far southwest China over by Tibet, Thailand, Vietnam. Um, when I had first joined, they had solely a Chinese website. It was very much geared around what was translated as, you know, like public science outreach, right? The goal was to showcase the government's work in the area, promoting biodiversity, genomics research, HIV AIDS research, and, you know, new drug testing. Consequently, they handed me, you know, just, you know, here's the website. We need to make something in English. And the first conversation was, why is the logo so big? <laughs> the response was, the logo is big because it's important. That should be the first thing that someone sees, that had gone through rounds and rounds of sign-off between Beijing and the local institute that I worked at. Um, and they, their interesting question that I posed them was, so where do someone actually find what the research is? That apparently was not a key factor. They figured the scientific audience abroad would be more likely to actually download the paper from a peer review journal, so it didn't really matter it was on the website. Going through this you know, two-year UX process with them on making an English site, we took all the original Chinese content, but walked through the idea that logo and affiliation matters much more to just showcase and give some very subtle context to the content, but the content is actually far more impactful. So we ended up with a much more tiled layout where the research is very prominently featured, right? Within two or three clicks, you can get to you know, the major funding, all the major projects. And just kind of a little more detail, right? They had a huge recruitment drive. How do we get people who are from abroad to come and join, right? In particular, they were targeting researchers from Africa, other East Asian countries, and Southeast Asia as well. So, very simple, join us. Give them a very prominent call to action that anyone can see and understand. Um, we talked about folding this back in to the original Chinese site, and the response was, no, no, the current site is great. It meets all functional needs. The logo is very big. There's dedicated links off to more content that are elsewhere, but the main focus needs to stay here. And that actually worked really well. Aside from it looking a little bit dated, this was a very successful web project in the terms of uptake, of usage internationally was quite high. Even usage within mainland China had gone up substantially once we had reshaped some of the content and just balanced out the colors and tone a little bit. Um, and really this kind of led, when Adrian and I were talking about this, did this presentation, that it's a who are you building for, right? A scientific audience out of southwestern China is very different than a global multinational company out of the US or Europe having a separate office set up in China. Um, so just three quick things when you're thinking about who you're building for, right? Just take some time to know the audience actually go through those very basic UX exercises of who is this for. Check out you know, any trends, in this case for China, right? The average age for someone using Baidu as a search engine is 25. If we're looking by comparison, the average age of a search engine user in North America is you know, an entire 10 years in advance of that. In Europe, even higher. 
And funny enough, this actually bears out quite a bit in terms of the interaction patterns. Um, you know, average researchers, or sorry, searchers, excuse me, on mobile in Bidy will spend up to 55 seconds on the page before deciding where to go next. I actually was a little confused when I read this research that in the US it's eight to 10 seconds, but try spending a minute on a Google search result screen, it feels painfully long. If you haven't found something within that first you know, 10 to 20 seconds, it's, the interaction just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and then even, this is bled over, I looked at uh, a colleague of mine who works over at Muji, large e-commerce brand out of Japan. Um, the sites between you know, Japan, Korea, and China look very similar, but in reality, the content is radically shifted from site to site. The call to actions are quite different. Um, some products are given lists in one region, they're given tiles in another. At the end of the day, even just saying this is the you know, East Asian brand for Muji doesn't make a lot of sense because market to market, the variations are quite stark. And actually, there's a great story behind why differences can be so stark. Adriana, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, to tell the funny story about it, uh, last week in New York, I was doing a presentation about uh, building a multi-platform uh, for one of our clients. And um, we had a multi-site installation targeting various uh, countries in Asia. And it was po pointed to us that one of the countries that we were targeting didn't have a language switcher, although all of the other websites from the area had it. So they asked us, why is that? And the answer to that would be because um, based on our usability tested, testing and based on the local market needs, this was actually a feature. It was intended to be like that because we were trying to serve the local market. And we want to make a very important point here because even after you do all of your research um, and you do the mock-ups, you do the prototype of having something to be rolled out on the market, before you actually take a step and start doing the implementation and uh, rolling out everything that you have, it's important to do the usability testing. Get a target group of users that represents your key personas that are going to interact on the website in the future and test with them how everything is perceived. How do they interact with all the elements? Do they understand the function and the meaning behind all of them? Do they feel comfortable with it? Are they going to get back on your website or on your product or on your app to do that? It really is going to provide you very valuable feedback in regards to the future success of your platform. So we wanted to make that key point because uh, if you do this at the early stages, it's going to save up a lot of time in the future and a lot of money. In sum, it actually is a feature, not a bug. I always look forward to when I can say that because it's not often enough. But um, in the case Adriana was speaking about, Right, in Japan it was very important for like this particular platform to look like a fully native Japanese company, right? It couldn't appear to be a multinational, hence every little element of any other language was scrubbed out, all the regionalization was removed, there was no way to access like the higher brand. Um, and funny enough, this plays out in a lot of you know, large brand house companies, right? How often do you want that top level brand exposed? Do we all really want to know that the same 10 companies own everything we buy? Generally, no. Um, and I know we've only got you know, a couple minutes left, but we do want to hit on some key pieces of like the tech stack just because it's DrupalCon. <laughs> so Adriana, go ahead. Yeah, so there's also a couple of important um, aspects to think about when targeting the Asian market. And one of them is, of course, hosting. Um, so you may want to have a decision of hosting in the area or not. It's not exactly necessary depending on uh, the type of business that you're doing. So in some cases you ha may have legal compliances that you need to follow. It's very important to do your research to actually understand if that is a requirement or if that is a preference. Um, and then if you have a platform of choice for hosting, um, you know, maybe you want to use that for the future. Um, even if you don't host in a specific country, uh, we always recommend to use a CDN just to make sure that everything is going to be served fast and um, you know, very nicely for everyone in different countries. 
Ideally, uh, you may want to choose a CDN service that has as many global points as possible, especially in the areas where you are targeting to get more visitors from, um, and that will ensure a better performance. As always, uh, we recommend our clients to do performance testing uh, before launching their products. Uh, that will help understand what the numbers are going to look like once you go live. And uh, make sure that when you do this testing, um, you use um, tools that allow you to test from that country specifically, because the data is going to reflect a more accurate situation. Right, and kind of an interesting side point there is when we do you know, load and performance testing in the US, right, we don't just say, oh, we're going to test in Omaha. We usually try, you know, what is New York going to load like? What is San Francisco going to load like? You know, get a much better view of the country. Um, I've seen countless times where I get a load testing report on a site, and the stakeholders are wondering, well, why does it feel slow? Well, you're testing in a city that's a solid 2,000 miles away. Um, I'm sure the internet and access point there is fantastic, but there's a bit of lag considering that you are in some place quite distant. Um, so when you're choosing a CDN, not all CDNs are made equally. Go through and actually double check what is your core you know, geographic persona, right? Are you looking at people in center of a country, coasts, you know, farther inland? And also, do you need to actually do some optimization work to make sure those load speeds are accurate to where you're trying to serve? Uh, simply just going through that usually can result in, you know, picking a better CDN and, you know, 50, 60 percent performance increase. One thing we couldn't build into this presentation because of time is that nice uh, study that keeps coming out that you lose, what, 15 percent of visitors for every 900 milliseconds that you don't load faster. When this looks at, you know, global scale, it's a little bit different. Um, certain regions expect four to five seconds, other areas, you know, less than one but that's a whole separate presentation that we can get into on another day. Uh, the other point we would like to discuss about is domains. Again, depending on the business nature and what you're trying to achieve, you may want to use a more global domain um, or you may want to use a local one. Um, probably that's going to have an impact on the SEO in some cases as well because when you're targeting local markets, that is going to be a key indicator in how you show up in results. Um, so keep that in mind if that is an important thing for you. And uh, we want to take a moment to also discuss a little bit about the great firewall and some of the details that would be important to mention for that. Um, if you want to do things in China, there's uh, a couple of aspects you should be aware of. If you want to host there, um, you will need an ICP license, which is usually requiring a lot of paperwork and a business entity that you need to have in China. Um, so that is something that you definitely need to be aware of. Um, if you go to any hosting uh, providers there, they will not grant you hosting without having an ICP license, and then you have to include that information um, to be present on your website, to display that you have the authority to actually be present on the market. Now, if you do not want to host in China, it doesn't necessarily mean that you cannot host anywhere else and that your website is not going to be accessible from China. It's just a difference in how you target the local market and how everything is um, considered from that perspective. And more generalized, I would say just always double check with legal compliance for any region that you're actually trying to launch something in. Because yeah. um, there can be a lot of things that are either suggestions versus requirements, depending on where you're at. Um, even getting into small things like, you know, your top level domains. Is .edu different than .edu.cn? Is that different than .cn? What are the different factors to consider in even applying for one of those? Um, this can take weeks and weeks or months to resolve, so definitely probably plan out relatively early on what your goal is, uh, but do not leave that to the end because a lot of lovely projects I've seen over the years, especially when I was working in China, ended up getting launched and then not launched because someone had forgot to do some paperwork a few months ago. Another quick comment on the slide before, uh, just Sorry. before we wrap up. Um, check. If, Check the documentation and the legal paperwork that you need to actually buy domains in different countries. You may need to follow different regulations for that too. And um, based on our experience, if you use uh, an international or the, the CN domain, 
for a site that is hosted outside of China, you may want to double check that your DNS records are applying for uh, the inland China as well as outside of China, because otherwise your website might not be um, accessed by various people unless they use a VPN. Mm -hmm. And actually, kind of last one on access there is make sure that for whatever region you're in, the appropriate tools can be logging the activity and be accessible. Right? This would be a whole separate yep. presentation on its own, but you know, go through, make sure if you're trying to track all of your like top level business goals in Google Analytics that they actually flow and that you don't need an alternative. Same for you know paid search, organic search. Make sure you're targeting the appropriate engines that are accessible in region. Yeah, and the other thing we want to uh, mention here is also when using different social media sharing functionalities or ways to present media on the website, you need to adapt to the local market as well uh, because um, the Chinese audience may not have access to YouTube or Vimeo or tools like that, so you may want to use tools that are accessible in their countries, things like uh, Tencent videos, Yoko, or some other platforms that are available there. Uh, for social tools, they uh, use a lot of WeChat, um, and there's a lot of things integrated there. So you want to make sure that you tailor the experience of your platform to the local audience from um, the area that you're targeting. Yep. And with that, we have now summed up the four-hour exercise of launching in East Asia into 20 minutes. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> you come to the mic just because it's recording. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my organization is uh, launching a website for Japan, and in my research in uh, constructing the paths or the URLs, I was got conflicting information about using, you know, Japanese characters uh -huh. uh, in paths or you know Mandarin characters in a Chinese site. Um, do you have any best practices that you sure. know? Of? Um, so one kind of general note is um, back to like you know where you're targeting traffic. Uh, Baidu actually ranks Chinese character strings heavier than, you know, transliteration strings. So for that particular market, because it has its own search engine, that can be a much larger factor. Um, but on terms of Japan, Adriana? Uh, based on our experience, we use mostly transliterate functionality um, because that has been easier to work with. Yeah. And also make sure that if you're going to do that, you need to have all the pass sets so you're rendering in the right Unicode and nothing's getting corrupted and you're getting, you know, long long strings that don't actually render. Um, but I'd say like the question of using a different language set outside of like the Latin character group, um, it's most important if you're doing a site within China um, that you want to try ranking within Baidu. I think we have time for, looks like one more question. Quick question, uh, WeChat, China um, being told that there's a lot of emphasis on using that and integrating with it well. Do you have any recommendations about how to bring your business, bring your business into WeChat? Me not knowing much about it yet, but uh, sure. yeah. Um, so actually, Huge Inc. does an incredible guide to a day in the life of a um, you know Chinese mobile user mm -hmm. that actually walks you through from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep everything you use WeChat for. It's a great you know three to four page guide. So you know free advertising for Huge. <laughs> um, but generally speaking, WeChat is kind of like the app to end all apps, right? Everything kind of integrates to it. Depending on if you want to do commerce, that's a very different type of integration than if you're trying to build more social traffic or if you're trying to integrate to another related service that already has like a core WeChat function built in. Um, building micro apps within WeChat is a whole exercise unto itself. It's very rarely worth the effort, um, but we've played around with it a few times. Yeah, and it's really, you want to make sure that your organization has a strategy for how to do that as well, because actually building out the strategy is going to take more time than implementing it. So make sure everyone is aligned regarding that. Right, and I think on a previous case, we'd encountered the idea that you know WeChat, since it acts a lot like Facebook in some ways, is advertising within people who already know about you versus trying to push traffic out and garner that. Um, I know we're out of time, so thank yeah. you, everyone. Uh, feel free to come grab us if you have any additional questions. And we want to remind you <laughs> to join the contributions. Uh, you have the schedule here for when they will be happening and where. Uh, and please provide feedback on how we did on the presentation and everything else you are experiencing here.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone.